How many of you have less than a year's experience with asterisk? Okay. How many of you were dragged along by your boss or coworker and said, you must see this? I see that. Okay, all right. Okay. How many of you have, say, two to four years of asterisk experience? A couple? Okay. How many of you began asterisk when it was maybe back in version 1-2? A couple? Okay. 1-4? One 1-6? One Either three of the three versions? 1-6? Yeah. One eight. How many of you don't know yet? You can be honest about that if you don't know yet. We can, we can show you how to get the version of your asterisk. Okay. All right. How many of you are running a GUI, like a graphical user interface? Um, free PBX. Who's running a free PBX? How about Elastics? Got Elastics? A couple? Excellent. Okay. All right. And have you ever been on the command line, those of you? Okay. You've noticed that? Done that? Had to be there, didn't you, sometimes, to check it out. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is Asterisk from scratch. This is Astricon 2014. It's a high-level overview for those who are new to Asterisk, the project. Maybe don't know much about the project. Maybe you've come in through a GUI. Maybe somebody said, I have this box in the corner. It's running, and if it goes down, we're toast. Guess what? You were hired to take care of it. Raise your hand if you experienced that. In the closet, had to do that because nobody else knew. All right. And because more and more people come in to Asterisk World through the GUI, we have no expectations that you know some of the fundamental things that you might know if you would come in, say, 10 years ago and downloaded it from the web because so many people are now using these distributions. So high-level overview, we try to cover the things that will make you comfortable for the rest of the conference. I'm Melissa Shepard. I am now the Asterisk Training Manager with Digium. I've been there just over a year, maybe a year and six months. Before that, I came from a systems administrator background. I was doing sysadmin for the government, and then before that, for large public library systems. Okay, if you want a thankless job, you talk about public libraries. You guys think you've got that. Um, I am decapped, and I can get you decapped if you come to maybe a training course with effort and yeah, practice on your part. But we can certainly give you the decap certification test while you're here. And if you'd like that, then stop by the front desk, and we can try and get you um, scheduled for that. If you want to chat with me later, Twitter handle, the rest of this. And these slides would be available afterwards. If you simply leave me your business card, then I can send you the slides. Okay? Or make them available on a uh, downloadable site, Dropbox or so. Okay. All right, now where am I from? Where's Digium from? I don't have any candy to throw at you like David Duffett does. Y'all know David Duffett, the Witty Brett community director? If you don't know him, you're going to meet him during this conference. Okay. He will throw candy at people when he trains. I don't usually do that. Okay. Alabama. We are headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And what are we going to cover during the day? We've got lots of excitement here. This is the kind of course, or really presentation, where you can wander in and wander out all day if you want. If you don't like a certain part of it, or if you want to go and check in on the hackathon and look over their shoulders and see what they're doing, that's perfectly great. We have it scheduled so that you can take the breaks when the breaks are available. And also, I'll be available to answer questions during that time period if you need. This morning, introduction to asterisk, make no expectations that you guys know anything about it, but some of you do, right? And that's where we'll begin. Asterisk architecture, break. Uh, installing asterisk, the different ways you can do that, and you can get the code to put on your own machines. And the introduction to dial plan, that word that everybody says, they throw it around, and they expect you to know something about what they're talking about. All right, it's the first thing you hear when anybody says asterisk, oh, the dial plan. Talk a little bit about that. Then we will have lunch at 12.15. Lunch today will be served by the pool, the very large pool, the several pools. You'll find it. It'll be out there. 
Okay. And then we will return. Or actually, you will return, and Justin Hester, who is the Asterisk technical trainer, will take over while I get prepared for the fastest dude to the dial tone contest. You guys heard of that? Fastest dude to the dial tone. It's like, it's a challenge wherein you do some dial plan, and you're in a race against someone else, and we will see who comes out ahead in the configuration task. This is a fun thing. It will be in the expo hall when the expo is open this afternoon, and we'll be running that. And anyone is eligible to try their hand at that. Okay. And Justin will take you through configuring endpoints, interactive dial plan, and advanced dial plan at the end. Okay. Now, um, what else is happening that you might want to go to? This is pre-conference day, and so it doesn't have the chopped up nature of the rest of the schedule because you'll have talks tomorrow and Friday that'll only last about an hour. So there are some of the, that today, too. We have a distro track, free PBX and Elastics here to speak. We've also got a Digium commercial business track if you're interested in the product, which way it's going. Then you might want to step over there. And as I said, we have also got the hackathon, which is going on at this time. All right. So somebody tell me, where are you from? Back over there. Yes, where are you from? Tucson, Arizona. Pretty close. Who's here from the farthest away? It's a party game. Hong Kong. Hong Kong, that's pretty good. Anybody got that beat? Australia. Australia. Oh, that's good too. Okay, you know Rob Thomas down in Australia? The schmooze? Uh, okay, well, I haven't met him yet, but that's interesting. Okay, I've got an asterisk patch for you two guys at the end because you said that you were the furthest away. Okay, remind me to come up and get that. All right. So I've asked you what you've used. You said, yeah, GUIs, some of you. Some of you, is anyone still running 1.4 or 1.6? I asked that question at nine. Yeah? Not sure? Back there? OK. All right. Are you eager to get off that? OK. Tell me some of the problems that you might find in running a version that old. The GUI's not very good. So what's the use of running the GUI? Yeah, that's part of it. OK. I had a little bit of an introduction to Asterisk just beginning. The objectives of this module before we get to break is what is Asterisk? I mean, if there's nobody in this room who, if there's somebody in this room who doesn't know the answer to that question, you will know it by the end of the day. Okay. You may have been dragged along by your boss, and you don't have a really clear idea of what is asterisk and what is its place in the unified communication ecosystem. Where does it, what position does it hold? I would argue that it's a foundational brick. Okay, that's where it is. All right. And that would be its place in the ecosystem, is holding up many, many millions and millions of dollars worth of business. Okay, and many millions of systems. And Millions of phone calls, millions of texts, millions of communications. It's software. What can it do? Well, I gave you part of that, alluded to some of that. And a little bit about who is Digium. Is that sometimes a little bit of a confusion when you first step into an open source product and you're not sure about a company that shepherds a software project? Is what is their relationship? What do they have invested in it? What's at stake? And what's at stake for you? We'll talk about that, too. Okay. So I talked a little bit about versions, and I did a query about who's got the oldest version. I may have another asterisk patch for somebody who can actually verify that they have the oldest version of asterisk running in their organization in production. Okay. But nobody's running 1.2? 1.4? Anybody else running? OK. Good. So you got, we got two people running 1.4. All right. 1.2. You're running 1.2. I, you got the patch, sorry. He's got to share. Can't do that for you. Okay, so you got, you've got a, I've got a nice um, orange asterisk patch that you can sew on a nice jacket later for them. Okay. All right. And so looking at this, asterisk does have a long history. Has anybody been in it since 99? Anybody out there downloaded that software and used it since 99? Okay. How about uh, the first major release of it in 2004? We grabbed that in 2004, and that was version 1. Okay. This is an outline of asterisk history and generally how it goes. Every year, pretty much on schedule, a major release 
a little bit of a shakeup with the asterisk versions 1.6, 1.61, and 1.62. Those actually do represent a distinct major upgrade in version, not a subversion. And some people, when they say 1.6, you have to be specific about which version you're on, because with each one came major advancements. Now, they changed this to be more meaningful or useful. In version 1.8, that was the last one on that numbering sequence. Okay. And asterisk 11, 12, and we're anticipating asterisk 13, which is now in beta and has significant changes with it. And in fact, if you want to find out the types of significant changes in asterisk 13, um, software lead Matt Jordan is speaking on Friday about the changes you're going to see in that version. You'll get a little bit of that today and look forward looking. But everything we say is actually going to point you to a program to go to for the rest of the conference if you need more information. Okay. Can anybody tell me the difference right now between a uh, long-term support release and a uh, standard release? So we're going to get into that a little bit, too, when we talk about architecture. Every other year, a long-term support release versus a standard release. And if you were going to put something in production, a standard release is where all the new and juicy stuff goes in. Okay, that's where all the stuff that goes in that you may not want to put in production, but you definitely want to try it out. And especially if you have applications that you, you custom built, then you're going to want to look at the standard release and write your rewrite your applications if necessary, or anything else, dial plan, whatever. And then for production, you would go with a long-term support. And in this one, your long-term support currently, our current long-term support release is asterisk 11. Right? Now that's subject to change very soon. Right. We also do have asterisk 12 out as our standard release. And 13, which will be the long-term support release, is in beta. Okay. Doesn't mean you can't play with it, just means you might not want to. Does anybody uh, actually like to play with the beta releases? And uh, what, what drives you to that? Mm -hmm. Great. So that you don't get any big kicks or surprises or um, making sure you get the readme files so that you detail all the changes because each one does come with that. And if you're upgrading from a much earlier version, you should probably read all of the uh, readmes. And we'll show you where those are too. And so what about asterisk? All right, open source. If you are new to the project, new to the asterisk project, or new to software at all, how many, let, let's step up. How many of you come from a Windows background? How many of you started in Windows? So I'm just like, you can be honest about this. I was a, a group policy administrator for years. A lot of you. It, it really does exist. Windows exists. We know it does, right? And they even, I've heard, have a unified communications um, software. Ed, you heard that too? Okay, something called beginning with an L link, right? That is a proprietary piece of software. What do we mean by proprietary? Okay. It does what? They control the code. In fact, that's four words that says it really succinctly. They control the code. All right. They have it. And if you wanted changes to a code to code in a proprietary system, how would you go about getting that? Pay a lot of money, both of those. Send in the request, beg, scream, cry, why doesn't it do this, and pay a lot of money. In fact, for every probable little feature that you wanted, you might have to do that. And then, would they implement that? Maybe. Maybe, yeah, no and maybe. Those are probably good, all right. If it's a features request that is profitable for them, that they can monetize, then they will do that. If it's something that you want that's cool and neat, not only with proprietary software, are you forbidden from touching the code to change it to do that, you can't get access to it, you can't do it. Not unless you're an employee, and if you do it while you're an employee, it better be for the company, right? Okay, so open source is different. Open source communications platform. Telephony in the days of old. Any, any old style telephone guys in here, girls? Or it's like, when did you start, what did you start working on? Okay, all right. So with your um, much experience, have you ever, you've installed PBXs, old style PBXs, um, You've done punch downs, you've run actual extension lines that correspond. Yeah, okay, everything like that. These are, you know, that's rapidly dying. There are a lot of people in this room who, who have never actually dealt with a proprietary PBX. What sort of, what sort of PBXs, what brand names did you work with? Just, uh, what, did you work with, it? has anybody else worked with any other proprietary old style PBXs, say, 
Okay. What did you work with? Shortel, that's one, right. And if you wanted to make changes to Shortel, it was pretty much the same situation. They delivered to you a machine that did something mysterious that usually mapped, had a one-to-one -one extension map phone to uh, extension. And when you needed to add something, you had to call a service agent to do it generally. You couldn't do it yourself, right? How do you like that? Can you imagine that in asterisk? It is a do-it-yourself, isn't it? Everything about it is a do-it-yourself. But if you turn around and look at the person next to you, it's not really a do-it-yourself, is it? Look around and see who's here. It's a community. Because somebody out there has probably tried what you want to try. And they probably have the answer for you. So, I mean it. Look around. Come on, come on, guys. Like, loosen up, loosen up. Look around. Hey! Like, you don't have to shake hands, but just see, see who's here. Okay. All right. Because they will be your friends. By the end of this conference, especially if you go to the party at the Cherry Lounge. Everybody's friends there. They will be by morning. Okay. So the reason that you are in the room today is to get insight, to get some information to take back about this open source communication platform. That proprietary PBX, it may have been a computer, okay, but what Asterisk is, is the software that enables you to take and change any piece of hardware that will support it into your own PBX. You don't have to call Shortel with their hardware solution, that everything is pre-coded and you have to call somebody. It is software downloadable that you can make it do any unified communication things that Asterisk supports. We'll talk about some of those. Right. Open source really changed the way that people looked at things. If you were in the IT business back in 1999, say, how many of you were, how many of you were old enough to have been heavy into the IT world in 99. See, I'm raising my hand. I'm admitting, I am that old. OK, all right. Then you will know at that point in time, what did people say about open source in 99? It's still in development. Or more importantly, what did your boss say when you said, oh, oh my gosh, there is this thing, and we can connect it to the library automation system, and it will do, it'll do call out. We can use it to dial our customers instead of having these modems where they dial in to check the status of their books. And what do you think your boss said? Well, my boss said. What do you think my boss said? Yes, that's what they said. OK. And I said, you call the students at UAH. They'll help me. That's right, isn't it? I mean, university support. Or better yet, they say, um, well, how much is that going to cost? What? It's only going to cost like under $1,000? I don't think we can do that. That sounds suspicious to me. We, we can't do that. It was entrenched. Because open source was not seen as a thing that was supportable, was it? And that was the key issue. You said the word, support. But that's over now, isn't it? Can you imagine anybody saying that blanket statement about open source software today? Can you? If you say open source, people say, how do we do that instead? Not, we can't do that, that sounds suspicious. And what is open source? You said it pretty much. Open source means that you have the code the actual code available to you to manipulate, to create things with, to take further, and depending upon how it is licensed, to share back with the community who needs that information. Okay. Community of developers, there are probably some 10,000 people right now writing code for asterisk as of last count, maybe more, people that, that we don't know. They take it and they haven't released it back to the community, but they're working on it. But 10,000 developers, I would say. Now, very few of those work at Digium. Most of those are in the community. Right. Really, probably most of the developers are here today. And they're all in that room right there, hacking. Aren't you curious about what they're going to come up with? I don't know. OK, but you can go off in a creative new direction with open source software. Because nobody's stopping you from doing that. Okay. You can find bugs in the code and report it back to the project. And in fact, you could, if you write software, if you're a C developer, you could create patches that would en enable everybody to succeed. Contribute it back. What kind of stuff can it do at this day and age? Well, we all know that it started out as a PBX, right? There's no doubt about that. What we mean is a, it was traditional telephony, and the idea was to get communications at that point. And if we're talking even 1999 and even up to, say, mid-2000 before everybody had a cell phone 
in their pockets than we were talking about traditional telephony analog? Yeah. Digital? Yes. And this new thing that was coming up, voice over IP, the idea was PBX. And there are a certain set of features that a PBX has. Somebody say, somebody tell me, what does a PBX always have? Usually. What? Connections. Extensions. Well, that's the one thing it does always have. And, they're not a, and it's not one-to-one -one mapping with a phone, an asterisk, which is different, too. Okay. Usually they have a certain set of things. Uh, what do you do when somebody calls in and nobody is there? Voicemail or messaging. And if somebody is there, but they're only one person and they're pretending to be a company of 15, what do you usually have? IVR. IVR or an auto, auto attendant. Sure. And Asterisk itself comes with applications that made that very easy for people to do. And people continue to develop specialty applications for that. In fact, in the sense of traditional and VoIP, I would say that those things for a PBX were essential. Okay. And that, at the heart, that's what Asterisk did. Okay. What else can Asterisk do now? It's extendable. Okay. It can integrate with business applications. Okay. Calendaring. It can, you can use calendaring through modules that developers have developed to issue you a call and bridge you into a uh, conference day at a certain point in time. If you miss it on your calendar and you're habitually doing this, you might look into the calendaring applications to be able to always get you into that conference when you need. And then you look good, not like the forgetful person that you are. Okay. It can email automatically. All right. Instant messaging. Browser integration, a big one coming up with WebRTC. You heard of WebRTC? Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you haven't learned everything you need to know about WebRTC yet. Yeah. Okay. You guys are going to love this conference. We do have some great programs later. And Mr. Billy Chia actually on Friday is giving a WebRTC uh, that you need to go to if you've not done that yet. Okay. It's excellent. But you know what? You know what this is, right? Okay. Or has somebody just told you you need WebRTC? Somebody tell me what WebRTC, can you give me a definition? Go ahead. Grabbing streams, I couldn't have said that better. Right, video, audio or video streams, or as they're also known, channels. Right, channels that data pass through. And we'll talk about channels too. That's all it is. So instead of you having to have like a Zoip or soft phone necessarily for everybody in your organization, a soft phone on that, they can instead use a browser and it might be integrated with your business. Okay. You would design that so if you click on it or follow certain paths in your browser, then it would automatically know who, who to dial. And it's all IP based. So it would simply go to the IP of the person you're referring it to, if you program this correctly. But it's all browser based, WebRTC, a different way of thinking about that. It can be done. Now, I'm not going to take too much time on that because there are programs on that a little bit later. Just a little bit of a definition for you. And video. Asterisk supports currently video pass-through. Okay. Right. So it's possible to do video conferencing with that. Okay. But probably 99% of you are using it in some form as a PBX. But would you say that's true? Using it as a PBX? Not everybody. Come on. I'm going to play some heavy metal music so you're all going to be going like this. I would like to see that. Okay. All right. Now, this is a figure, asterisk. Asterisk the software, the open source communication software that turns your browser or your, or turns your, sorry, open source communication server that turns an ordinary piece of hardware into a communication server. Where is it? How much? How widespread is it? These are some figures that came from the marketing department. I believe that they are based on figures that we arrived at because Free PBX contributes to us um, their knowledge of where Asterisk is. We'll talk about that in a second. 18% of the total business communication market is based in some way upon Asterisk, and that's worldwide. I believe it's probably increased since these figures in 2009. All right. Now, we don't know this for certain because Asterisk doesn't have a call home feature. If you install Asterisk, it has nothing that reports back to Digium that you are using it. Okay. However, um, free PBX, Schmooze, okay, they actually have pretty good metrics about how widespread that is. And we can gauge based on 
what we know about the deployment of free PBX and make estimates about how widespread asterisk is. And we talk about it being a platform. It is not everything unless all you wanted was a PBX. If all you want is a PBX, then it's a complete belt solution. If you want more, then it's just a platform. And there are certain ways that you could build that in. Now, this picture, I've got to apologize for this. The, Huntsville's the rocket city, and so they, somebody in training thought this was very clever several years back to put a rocket there. Okay. To describe asterisk, it would be the platform that's rolled slowly you know, down Canaveral until launch. Okay. And that's asterisk at the bottom. What you build on top of that. And maybe the structural struts on the back that are holding up the rocket would be the GUI if you have a GUI integrated with it. Because once again, that's just management of the system, isn't it? But if you wanted to build something such as, um, like, say, Qmetrics is built um, for queuing, or any of these other great companies that you're going to see in the expo hall, then that would be the total package, the rocket. They would be the rocket, but they might depend upon a GUI, and they might depend upon, well, they definitely depend upon those two things, asterisk. So platform, what you can build on. So conceptually, Asterisk is what you build that on. And out of the box, Asterisk doesn't do anything. But out of the box, it has the capability to be a PBX and for you to integrate with it and do things like that. Okay. If you wanted a complete built product, Switchbox, you know, that's proprietary, but Digium owns Switchbox, and we'll talk about that. It is a proprietary PBX. It's a complete package. All right. Now, you know, this is how I began back in 1995 was probably the uh, Apache web server and what you had to do with it. Remember I said, out of the box, Asterisk does pretty much nothing. You can install it, but you've got to put endpoints on it. You've got to do other things. And most importantly, if you do put some endpoints in there, you've got to start creating something called dial plan. It's a little bit of scripting, dial plan. Okay. Apache does more out of the box. Apache at least shows you a splash page in its web directories that says, congratulations, you've installed it. OK, but you even have to create a little bit of dial plan when you first install it. Either that or load the sample files and reload, and then install an endpoint to make Asterisk do something. It's all there, but this is how you would get started. Every software, well, yes, I, every software, depends upon how you do it, requires configuration. Just how you do it. Windows is famous because everything is point and click, isn't it? You just grab it and go. All right. With this, or with open source, and especially Linux-based software packages or things that came out of the Linux world, require configuration, usually in a file that ends in a extension, yes, yeah, .conf, a conf file. In fact, people go around and they say, dial plan, look in your conf file, look in your conf file. This is what they're talking about. Pay attention. Okay. In fact, configuration for Apache here, if you wanted to configure Apache, that you would to do anything, you have to have a basic HTML file. And in this case, everybody knows HTML widely or at least has had some exposure to it. In the head, it's going to display on screen in header one, height, hello world, end body, end HTML. So that when that's called by Apache, it displays in your browser a certain way. That's the way that configuration works. Analogous to that is the second example, Asterisk Communication Server. You might open up a file called extensions and you might put in it a little bit of scripting logic that we're going to explore in depth a little bit later. Extension number 100, which could be dialed 100 DTMF tones. Priority one would be answer. Law. First thing you do, answer. Makes a channel, creates a channel. Okay. Wait a second, play back a sound file called hello world and hang up. This is basic configuration. It's what you start with. Okay. But it doesn't do that until you start building your logic, although it does come, it's replete with samples files. And remember, I told you to look around earlier at your neighbor because perhaps they have some sample configuration you can borrow later when you're stuck. Okay. And we'll give you, if you're not on the user list, if you don't haunt wiki.asterisk.org, if you don't do any of these things, you're here to get connected. Let us show you how to get connected to those resources that can help you when you start this configuration. Okay, what about asterisk characteristics? Oh, now some of you who have been in the 
game, if asterisk, since 1.2, I cannot claim to be. You heard me say I was a Windows Group Policy Administrator, and so I did not do that. It is now over 14 years old. I love to watch this little clock tick up. Every year at Astricon, we get to say, it's almost 15, it's almost 13, it's almost 14, it's almost 15. Stability was a problem in the earlier days. Does anybody have experience with that? No good. OK, so a little bit, one person. But you know, it's rock solid now, right? We're all, we're all good? OK. So as it, as it progressed and development progressed, what you now have is, as it says, a mature enter enterprise capable, and I am sincere about this, if you do not believe that it is enterprise capable and scalable, there is a man named Ben Klang who can show you on, I think on Friday morning, oops, I'm uh, pitting Billy and uh, Ben Klang against one another, that he can actually tell you a little bit about scalability and how you can measure that. I anticipate that's going to be a very valuable program, enterprise capable so that you can have more than one Astra server, you can have redundancy, you can have everything that you expect in enterprise communication. Okay, and as I said, global community, this is almost certainly increased. We know it's over a million production servers. It just is. But how many? I don't know. Maybe one for every person on the planet. If you have some good numbers on that, though, or have seen some good numbers recently, then let me know, I'd be interested. Okay. All right. And dual license. All right. Now, we probably know about the uh, asterisk GPL, too. Anybody heard of, of, of GNU or new GPL licensing? GPL licensing, what it does under open source means that you have certain rights to it. If it's licensed under GPL, any change, you can make changes to the code all you like, essentially, but you have to contribute your changes back. Okay. And that's how the software continues to develop. Right. But we also at Digium have a commercial OEM license as well. And the OEM license is for businesses who need to close their code, need it to be proprietary for security reasons, or because they put a lot of research into it and their product is such that if they were to try and use it and share the source, they would no longer have a revenue stream for that. And so Digium will sell you a commercial OEM license for that. It's slightly different, and you can close it then and keep your changes private. All right. Well supported, I would have to say. I have to say it's one of the better supported communities about people answering you within 24 hours, anybody from out in the community, people who are knowledgeable and working with it, if you're on the users list, if you're on the wiki, uh, if you just simply keep in touch with other asterisk users. I mean, asterisk users, free PBX users, any distro that's associated with it. You should probably, if you use anything other than plain vanilla asterisk, you should be looking at all their users list because many of them cross boundaries. Okay. Now some asterisk use cases. We're going to cover these quickly because they are things that you have probably seen before. And D, traditional PBX, okay. Or even to think about how many people began. And this was a setup that we had where I was working back in the early 90s and uh, 2000s and up through 2005, was a VoIP hybrid so that you could bring your telephony system into the future. Perhaps we didn't have enough money at the time to replace all of our analog lines. We had a proprietary PBX that we needed to keep. But most importantly, we needed a feature server. And we had multiple locations, some of which were out of county. And back then, they would charge long distance for out of county in Alabama. And in this case, what we did was connect the PSTN where we could. And to our remote offices, um, we would connect over the internet and make phone calls via SEP. Now, you can see up here a remote user could even go in through here. And this is really, the es in the essence, that the PSTN is pretty robust, and it was fine for our local calls. But if we wanted that one outlying branch that we had to pay long distance for, then we could funnel the calls through the internet. And this is also a very popular use case for remote users who will call in. Salespeople. Okay. Or in fact, you know, toll bypass, which is much part and parcel of the same thing. 
And this is more like what I was talking about where we saw that. We had a PBX that was, oh my gosh, it was in Essex. It was installed in 86. And by 2004, 2005, it was pretty rugged. I mean, pretty ragged, not rugged. It was rugged but because it lasted that long, but it was not what we needed. Um, still, though, we didn't have the money to rip out everything by that point, so we kept our analog lines. But once again, we were able to have Astra servers running and connect over the internet, who would then hand off through our ITSP to the PSTN any calls that needed to go there. And here, essentially, just what we were paying for internet service and managing quality of service between our locations. Then we could use our own, own analog, our old proprietary PBX, and use asterisk to funnel our SIP calls. Okay. And in fact, feature server in this case is exactly what they're doing. Maybe there's one particular application in asterisk that you might want to use. Maybe you love their voicemail. Maybe you love Confridge for conferencing, or even Meet Me. Lots of people really enjoyed Meet Me, which is an application for conferencing. It's now being replaced by Confridge in these latest versions. But you can actually, with a, a PRI connection, connect it to your old uh, PBX and still maintain your service. And yet this is rapidly disappearing, except in some parts of the... Um, I do find that um, we get more call for training for digital services, PRI, PSTN, from places like India and South America, where it's still prevalent. But other places in the world, SIP is replacing this. And this last little bit, what do you need enterprise systems to do? How do you need them to interface? Okay. Some of the things that they need, redundancy, um, high availability, meaning if one fails, you need to be able to redirect calls or whatever it's doing. If voicemail server fails, you need to be able to redirect it. Okay. And security and NAT traversal. And a very popular solution now, and I, I urge you to go to either OpenSIPs or any Kama Elio presentations you see, is to put a SIP proxy to redirect your calls to wherever they're going. And in this case, we can see it staggered out. You have your, uh, your voice attendant here, cues and voicemail on a different server. And everything, everything has access to a database, which probably contains your SIP registrations and other items that you need. Okay, thanks. Databases, in fact, would be more likely. and the proxies would be the ones who would be handling the load distribution on that. Okay, well that's some of our objectives. Okay, another bit of an objective, who is Digium? Okay. Digium is the asterisk company because, do y'all recognize this man right here? Y'all, Mark Spencer, have you met him yet? Is he out there, did you meet him? Okay, how many of you have not met Mark Spencer yet? Okay, a few of you, okay. You can meet him, go up and say hi to him. This, this is his contribution to this is that he is the inventor of asterisk. Back when he was a um, computer science student at Auburn University, he was running Linux support services, which was a group that he had of his friends, and they would go around, and in 1999, no one knew enough about Linux to take care of it themselves, and they needed some support, and he would hire out his services. But it was blowing up his cell phone to get that many calls, and he found that he needed a PBX. So he took his seed money that he had gotten, just a little bit of it, and he went out and searched for a PBX, and he found that he couldn't afford one. Why? Because Shortel, what are they going to charge you? He can't afford it. And so he thought, being a computer science student, that if he could get voice data into a machine, it's all software, right? He could get it out. He could direct it any way he wanted to. So he decided he was going to make his own PBX. And he wrote this, and it's, it's, he, as if you heard him last year at Astricon, he had said if he had known what a big, huge project and how overwhelming it would be, then he would not have started it, but he was young, very young. So there you have it. Right. And so for our mission at Digium, open source, we support the Asterisk project, but also commercial. We have to sell things in order to support the Asterisk project. Why do you suppose that is? Oh, this one is an easy one. Go ahead because we don't charge anything for asterisk, okay. So you'll see when we stop and say, oh, this product and that product, come and have a look and see if we can do something for you, then it's because we're trying to support asterisk for you guys, all right. 
and headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama. We also have offices in Atlanta, which is where Digium Cloud Services is, and San Diego, which is home of SwitchFox. Our three lines, business communication systems, that is SwitchFox, that is that proprietary PBX that we have that is very glamorous, very lovely, does a great job and is just about to come out with a new version, okay? And that we can put um, on your premises, or Digium Cloud Services is SwitchFox in a cloud, and that's headquartered in Atlanta. And SIP trunking is coming for that too, new product offering, right? Where we are right here, where training is, or asterisk training, is right square in the middle, is asterisk products, things that help you connect asterisk, plain vanilla. Cards, do any of you use any Digium hardware cards to interface with a digital network, like a PRI card or analog? Couple, okay. Right. All right. Now, business communication systems, you can see that quite clearly here. What do we sell? On-prem, SwitchFox Cloud, SwitchBoard, uh, SwitchVox. This is just actually SwitchBoard. If you have never looked at a SwitchVox system and want to see why it's different, maybe, from Elastix or, or free PBX systems, they will actually show you that on the demo floor in the expo. All right. Okay, CCS, what do we sell here? We sell you training. Okay, we'll sell you certifications. Except the DCAA here is free. You can go online and take that. But DCAP is a systems administration. Can you deal with raw, plain vanilla asterisk? Okay, and can you deal with it successfully in 90 minutes is what it does tell you. And we'll go ra rapidly through those because I know you guys are going to visit the expo floor and actually talk to some Digium folk about these. Very good quality cards. And this is our distribution model because we do sell through resellers. If you try to purchase um, a card directly through Digium, you will pay a higher price, but we can put you in touch with resellers that would sell you those, including our phones, any product line we have. Okay, and so for this first module, that is the introduction. We didn't learn much about dial plan, did we? Just a little bit on that, just an intro. And so we wanna be able to answer the following questions, said, said we would at the end, and so now pop quiz time. Okay, answer, what is asterisk? Oh, say it louder. It's a communications platform, and expand on that. Absolutely. Yeah, open source, open source communications platform. Yeah, and makes, P, makes a fine PBX. Fine, fine PBX. Okay. Oh, I just answered that second question, didn't I? What can asterisk do? Okay. Now, what can asterisk do? Well, what do you use it for? A PBX? Sort of? Okay. What else did people use asterisk for? IVR. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, call distribution, huge one. Oh. Okay, all right. We're trying to get like it on, on film, everybody saying these things, because free international long distance, yes! Okay, we like that part. And in fact, um, some people inadvertently use it for other people's free um, international long distance. Okay, which is why I'm encouraging you also to attend the security talks. Um, it, Greenfield Tech, they're here. Like, yeah? Okay. All right. So, who was Digium? That's it. The Asterisk Company. That's, that's all it. We're, we're a bunch of people who care about open source software and want to see it continue because pretty much all of our livelihood and lives are based on it. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, maybe. Okay, we're a bunch of people throwing this great convention, right? Okay. If you weren't here this morning, I'm Melissa Shepard. Right now, currently, I'm the Asterisk Training Manager at Digium. We covered in the previous session who Digium is. We are the Asterisk Company. We are the company that shepherds the project, the open source project of Asterisk. And if you wanted to get in touch with me, then I will give you my contact info afterwards, or you can simply copy it down. If you do want a copy of these slides, Later, we can send those to you or make them available via Dropbox. You just need to leave a card at the podium when you're done, okay? 
All right, we did cover the intro to asterisk. We are going to cover a bit about asterisk architecture, which really forms your understanding of how the entire system works. And if you know anything about asterisk architecture, you'll quickly see that it is the architecture of it that has enabled asterisk to grow into what it is today. It's flexible, it's modular. You can change bits of it without having to change the entire thing. It's maybe less monolithic than many things that you would deal with. Okay. And then right after break, we'll jump into installing asterisk and then jump into an intro to dial plan. I said that word again, dial plan. We will get there. We'll have lunch. Does anybody remember where lunch is served? The pool. Okay. And after that, You'll return, and Justin Hester, Astra's technical trainer, will take over for this afternoon session, which is where you get to some really good stuff. In fact, we fought over this. We drew straws. We said, who gets the afternoon? And I lost. So, Goals for this module. A little bit about Asterisk and Linux. Does Asterisk run on Windows? No. No, no, no. Okay, modular architecture. Channels, someone mentioned them this morning as a matter of fact. Channels, streams, I don't know, you know, don't care what you call them, the concept is the same. Talk a little bit about the interfaces, the APIs and the CLI. And we'll talk a little about configuration file syntax. If you do not know it already, then Asterisk can run on any Unix-based platform. Yes, including Macintosh, although I would not advise it unless you wanted to take a week of vacation and communicate with developers a lot. Okay. Does anybody have it running on Macintosh? Gosh. Oh, well, I can't use, use you as a referral. There's nobody out there. Okay. Typically, it's run, it runs best, and it's best supported. I mean, SigWin, it will run on SigWin. All right. But best supported. For Debian variants and Red Hat variants. Okay? We run on CentOS in our classes. We could run on Debian or Ubuntu, but really Red Hat is probably has the lowest barrier to entry. Okay, into the concept. How many of you run it on a Debian variant? Anybody run Ubuntu or Debian? Okay. All right. Is it Debian? Or Ubuntu? Okay. All right. How about well, how about CentOS? How many of you run it on CentOS? Okay. If you were running a GUI, um, one of the popular distributions, chances are you're running on that sort of variant. Okay. You may even be running on a fork that's not CentOS anymore because they put certain restrictions in place last January, which disallowed some things we needed to do. Okay. But typically, you run it on whatever your boss says you're going to run it on. Is that right? I have a favorite. Okay. Modular design. At its heart, at its core, Asterisk is just a piece of software that manages things. It manages modules. It's all written in C, right? Anybody program in C? Develop for C? Okay. All right, some. If you're all sysadmins, that's good, too. My last C, C course was 10 years ago, and I'm not a developer, I will be honest. Okay. But I do know about modul modularity in life, as in software. If it's something that can snap in and perform without impacting someplace, something else, then that's what it needs to do. And in this case, you can see everything about asterisk, whether it's a resource or an application or a channel driver, and I'm making emphasis on that because I'm going to quiz you later, okay, is a module, dynamically loaded. So when you need something, some functionality, Anybody hazard a guess as to what appdial.so might do? What, what does it do? It dials stuff. That's all it does, right. It's an application, okay? And this is probably the first application you're going to learn about. Because the first thing you want to do when you set up a PBX is what? Call, exactly. And so dial is usually the first one. Yeah, you, you want some, to do something else, okay. But everybody else wants to dial. All right. And so you want to dial. And notice here. Those of you with familiar, familiarity with Linux, raise your hand if you don't have a lot of Linux experience. Okay. You know what? Even people who are excellent at Linux say they have no Linux experience. I don't know why that's so common to do that. But if you will notice that AppDialSO is actually the shared object library. It's a shared object library. Loads this library dynamically. You load it, you get functionality. You can dial one endpoint to the other. You unload it, you can't do that. All right. Now, if this cooperates, 
and it might not. Gives me blue screen, right? Then I can start up. We want to make that bigger, don't we? Let's make it huge. Okay. I'm going to start the command line with three levels of verbosity. Run, a connected. And with this, I'm on the command line. All of those shared object library, all of those SOs are actually in a directory. And every single one that is currently loaded, dynamically loaded on this instance of asterisk that I'm running right here on my virtual machine is going to show up. And because I didn't do something clever, then I can see that channel drivers, app, et cetera, that app dial is actually loaded here, dialing application. So because it's loaded, I absolutely know upside down, that I can call Jane over here. Jane, answer the phone, Jane. She may not answer. And if you were running the CLI or the interface and logged into Asterisk, you're going to see a lot of useful information, aren't you? Okay. Does everybody know that the first rule, and I'm going to stop right here and say, when we teach our classes, the first rule we tell you is no matter what distro you use, no matter what you do, if you are installing or configuring asterisk, get used to never doing a command unless you have a CLI instance up and running so that you can see informational messages. Anybody do that? Or do you just test it and hope for the best? Maybe? Hope for the best. Okay. Little, little tip on that one. Okay. So, Jane, I can call you. Really great. If I were to unload, unload, y'all use tab complete in Linux? It works on the asterisk CLI, too. So if I module unload, up, oh, app, oh, look at that. It's helping me out. Up, oh, look at that. Yes. Don't. And now I can prank my friends by saying, Jane, where are you? Oh, nothing. Nothing. In fact, what does it tell me that indicates a problem here? It's, okay. It says, no, we can't read it really well. No application dial. It says, no application dial. I've just unloaded that module. I have no functionality, right? Well, how about module load? All right. Up arrow also works on the CLI. And I should be back to normal. Just fine. Indeed. This modularity is quite good in a number of ways. As we're going to see, the modularity actually enables you to not load modules if you don't want them at all. For instance, if you install Asterisk 12 and you're going to go with the new PJSIP channel driver, we'll talk about channel drivers too, then you might want to unload the old SIP channel driver, the big monolithic one that you're going to learn about if you go to some some of the uh, presentations here, okay? Whoa. I've got to apologize for this thing. It's the, okay. All right, so turn them on, turn them off. I'm going to show you asterisk.conf a little bit later. What does the core do? It's system timing. It used to be that there was a program called Dottie. Has anybody heard of that? That's another ditching program, Dottie. If you have hardware cards with asterisk, then you might use Dottie. It is a, contains kernel drivers for you to be able to use the hardware cards. In fact, if you use Digium cards, if you use um, other competitors' cards, you're probably using Dottie. Okay. All right. Now, with that, it used to take kernel timing from that, but a lot of people didn't have hardware cards and they didn't want to load something extra. So don't compile Dottie because now the programs um, can take their timing, most of them, from the asterisk core instead. All right. With the exception of Meet Me. I referred to Meet Me earlier as a conferencing application. Meet Me still takes timing from Dottie. So if you want to use Meet Me, you will always have to go out and compile Dottie in addition to asterisk. We'll talk about compilation in the installation section in just a bit. What else does it do? Channel management. Where we said, what are channels? Channels are pathways, data pathways, into and out of asterisk. 
And who manages all that? The core. That's one of its primary businesses. Oh, and some of this I showed you already, except for this one part. Okay. Directory, user lib asterisk modules. Word of caution here. You remember when I did module show like SO? What that did was it looked for everything that asterisk had dynamically loaded. Now, if you go into the user lib asterisk modules directory, you're going to see lots more modules that perhaps I have not loaded. Maybe I haven't loaded them at all. Okay. And because I haven't loaded them, then they're not, not available. They might still be in that directory. If you look at the readme files, and we'll get to this when we talk about compilation and installation of asterisk also, the readme files give you a lot of good information. And in fact, a lot of information you better read. I don't know where I was going with that, but we'll, we'll continue with that. All right. User lib asterisk modules, that directory, you want to blow that away each time you upgrade asterisk. In fact, what you want to do is copy all those modules or back them up for a couple of reasons. Let's say you're going from 1.8 to 11. Those modules are version specific. You might have some luck running a module that was meant for 1.8 with 11, but there's no guarantees. And things, strange things will happen. And so one of the things the readme files will tell you is what I'm going to tell you. Make sure that you back those up, one, because if you have to roll back, you might need a quick copy of those modules. All right. Anybody ever have to roll something back? Yeah. You can be honest with me. I've had to do it. All right. And if you want to upgrade from, say, 1.8 to 11 or 11 to 12, you may want to, um, you want to wipe all that out so all the modules are consistent for that version. Asterisk will give you nasty warning messages if that's not so. All right. Let's go ahead and look at that. As a person with a new, brand new introduction to asterisk, let's go and let's see what directory I'm in. If you are first starting on the CLI, just go ahead. You're going to be spending a lot of time in Etsy asterisk because that's where all your conf files are. All right. Here's a, another tip. As a new person working with asterisk, if you ever make a change to a configuration file and wonder why your changes are not taken, you may have to, to uh, reload that modu the module's configuration. Okay? Usually, a GUI will do that for you, and you've never seen that. When you do save changes, it'll actually reload that for you. But you may have to do a dial plan reload to parse that configuration file and put the changes in place. And those configuration files being in Etsy asterisk, the master of them all, the one that you should look at first, is where everything lies. Where are these directories? Beginning at the top, okay. the modules directory, if you ever forget where it is. And these things can be redirected, too. And in fact, a lot of the distributions that you see that have GUIs do redirect it, and they redirect into custom directories. This is raw asterisk. This is how it looks when it's first compiled. But when you start building something and you need something in a new directory, you might choose to redirect. Okay. You might have custom directories. Anybody use free PBX? Have you ever seen the custom directories? Custom, con cu custom configuration files? Okay. Right. All of the important places, spool directory, okay. your log directory, which is important, running logger.conf, an application that will actually Trim your logs and move them out of the way is good. Some interesting things about this. This is, the one, this is one of the files that if you make changes to this file, being asterisk.conf, you're going to have to restart asterisk. You can't just reload that one module. Okay? Here's one that you can set verbosity at 3. With some versions of, an ele of 11 and up, you'll log in. You'll compile it and log in for the first time. And you won't see those handy messages on the CLI. They won't be there. Well, that's because the core verbosity is set at zero. All right. If you like it at three, look, here's a place you can change it. If you like to do what I do, which is um, use a uh, light background so people in the audience can see, you can set this so that your CLI will not gray out when you're running it by hitting light background yes. Ooh, thought I did that. Some different configuration settings that, uh, how about I do it right? How about that? You could do this or core reload, either one. 
making changes okay, to it. But a couple of different ways to start Asterisk as well. Starting a remote console with three levels of verbosity, because otherwise, as you saw in my asterisk.com file, it will start probably at zero at this point. Okay. A couple of tips and tricks for working with a CLI to begin with. You can actually stay in your CLI and run a shell command, a Linux shell command. Has anybody seen this before? Like, oh, I can't remember the IP address of my server. Ah, I don't want to jump out of asterisk. I want to see any messages that come up. So you can put a bang in front of it, an exclamation point, and at ifconfig, or which would be more useful in my case, the interface you're looking for. And I've never left asterisk. Now the, now the reverse is true as well. Here's another important thing about working on the CLI as we're covering this. If you're on the Linux command line, you can do the reverse. Let's see if you And you would do remote execute. Jump in and execute. And if I did core show applications, and I can use single quotes here too. Then without jumping into asterisk, I can list I see I can use the CLI command core show applications to show all of this. Just remember asterisk rx and the, the asterisk command you want. Not all asterisk commands work from the Linux command line. All right. In fact, I had someone do something that was recursive and it was very entertaining watching things scroll. And so all bets are off. Try it on a test system if you don't want interesting things to happen. And you can actually modify this as well. If I did a core show application, for instance, uh, this one always gets me core show application, uh, let's see. And you can actually pipe it to things sometimes with success. Sometimes. All right. Often weird things happen. And I can never, uh, core show application record. I can never remember the switch that allows me on hang up to record that thing, and I'm always losing my sound files. That's me. Okay. So if I grep and say hang up, without jumping into asterisk, I can grab part of a help file. And I just peeled a little part of that help file out that I wanted. Oh, there it is. Okay, keep recorded file upon hang up. In fact, jumping back into asterisk, I could start it this way, but it'll be a core, if I start it this way, it'll be a core verbosity of whatever I have set in that asterisk.com file. Anybody watch Billy Chia's? Asterisk one, two, three presentation, he loves this. He calls it rasterisk. And I will have to course that verbose manually if I do that. Okay, was off. Let's be verified. In these versions of asterisk, your verbosity is off until you turn it on. It's no longer default of three. Okay, All right. So what I did with the core show application, and this is where so much help is, core show application uh, record. And yes. Your first source of configuration information about applications, syntax, what you do, and what you can apply to it. And so from the command line, somebody tell me what the value of being able to perform an asterisk command from the Linux command line might be, the Linux shell. You were, yeah, you, just, you, said, you said the word script. Scripting, is that what you said? Yes, okay, very good. I, I'll give you a patch anyway, because you missed out on that one. All right, okay. So scripting, cron jobs, okay, task scheduler. If you want to be able to do, for instance, uh, this command, log or rotate, and this is probably pretty important, isn't it? If you want free disk space and get rid of it. Okay. Oh, it was it? like, log or rotate. That just rotated my logs. But suppose I wanted to set up a cron job or a timed job, and I use cron for that, and every single night, I would do log or rotate without ever having to touch it. I could do a bash script or some other script, doesn't matter, shell script, and I could use it to do log or rotate for me, and whatever else I wanted to do to process that file, and it would handle it for me without me having to go in and remember to check on that. And so being able to perform that means you can script asterisk commands from the Linux command line. Now let's get back to where we were. Some of those things that they don't necessarily teach you. Okay. Now, channels. Talking very quickly about channel drivers. We said channels were pathways into and out of asterisk. 
as of this time, we actually have two SIP channel drivers, programs that are written to use a technology, in this case, SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, for you to get calls from one end to the next, your start to your destination. And that is PJ SIP, which is based on the PJ Project, Telu's PJ Project, and the old SIP.conf, the old Chan SIP. You can use either of them in 12, 12 and 13. Asterisk 11 does not have PJ, PJ SIP yet. Okay. This has implications for when you compile Asterisk. You do have to make sure PJ Project is installed because it doesn't, it's not a single step compilation for you. Okay. SIP. EECS. That is not IAX. That is EECS. I didn't make it up. It is the inter asterisk exchange protocol. How many of you have seen this in the wild? EECS. Okay. What do you primarily use it for? Trunking between asterisk, Trunking between asterisk servers. It doesn't, you, you don't use it anyplace else. Although some people do like to point out, well, I use a Zoiper soft phone and I connect with Zoiper via EECS too, and I say, congratulations. Very good. Okay. Primarily it's used for trunking. It, it is, has its strengths as a trunking protocol. Okay. You will rarely see it for endpoints. And Dottie, I believe we talked about that before. That is going to be your digital and analog hardware cards that you find in the device. So a little bit about more about channels, okay? All channels, whether they're SIP, EECS, or Dottie, analog digital, in the asterisk world, have asterisks standing between your two endpoints. In fact, this sort of relationship is why asterisk is known as a back-to-back -back user agent and not a proxy. A proxy is going to pass information from one side to the other with one particular channel ID, and it'll maintain a channel, and it'll be one channel. With asterisk, when you make a call from your endpoint you, to the other, it has to go through asterisk first, creates a channel, and then asterisk will create another channel, and it will bridge those channels for you. Now, if you wanted to see this in real life, you can do this at home, no danger. Then you might look at your system, core show channel types, and I am so sorry, this is so bad. Let's make it better. And see what type of channel types you have built. Now look at this. You know what? Some of these I'm not even using. Why do I even have Dottie loaded? Ah, we can't see that. Sorry, I can see it on my screen. Why do I even have Dottie loaded? But I do have SIP loaded, a SIP channel driver. I have the EX2 channel driver, although I'm not using it. You don't have to load all of these, okay? So core show channel types if you want to check out your system and see what is there and trim that. And this is different because I have an asterisk 12 machine up. If I did perform the same command on it, just compiled plain vanilla right out of the box, it has many more channel types, at least four more. And one of those is PJSEP. Okay. And when you compile asterisk 12, both of those all right, come loaded. And you will have to decide which one you want to use. You can use both, but I would just choose one. Why do that? Okay. So with core show channels, core show channel types will tell you what's available. Then I can see right now nothing is going on. Nothing, nothing, nothing. All right. In the real world. Let's call Jane again. We can see, what we should see is that I have two active channels, one active call. Two channels per call. Okay. Because I am calling and two endpoints through asterisk. If I were to call, and we're going to hope this is right, it's Allison's IVR. I just called an extension 1000 that I could show you in extensions.conf, and all it does is attach to asterisk and play a sound file from asterisk. There's only a connection between here and here. I didn't dial an endpoint out. And so that is one channel with one channel ID. Guys, you didn't see that. So finally she waits and she says, I just had that up long enough. 
and we'll look at extensions.conf when we look at dial plan, and I'm going to show you that extension that just did that, because all it does is dial asterisk. The types of interfaces that you can use to deal with asterisk, plain vanilla asterisk, right? And in fact, if you were using a GUI, such as Elastics or FreePBX, they actually make much use out of some of these interfaces, such as AMI, the asterisk management interface. Okay. These interfaces.conf files, I showed you a little bit about that. Showed you the asterisk.conf, we're going to get to extensions.conf. I showed you a little bit about the command line interface. That's use is for the systems administrator who needs to get on that and see. And you can also produce debug information, SIP debug in any channel, PRI debug, lots of debug information that is more than system messages. And typically, debug information is for developers. But every now and then, especially with SIP debug, you're going to need to use that in order to figure out what's wrong with the call right, and why it won't connect. The Astra's gateway interface is extremely popular because it allows the fetching of external data from a database or an external resource and bringing it back. AGI is simply a, uh, a dial plan application that enables you to run a script. And that script can be in any language that accepts standard in, standard out, standard error, okay? Meaning Python, anybody else do PHP, Ruby? Those things, good, okay. So if you had something you wanted to retrieve, for instance, a weather report, and then play it back to the user, okay? Or to check somebody's uh, credentials in an external database. You might be using AGI to do that. Right. Asterisk manager interface, which is command, lots of people use it to do screen pop applications where it performs a command. All right, for instance, uh, let's see, I can think of it. Um, asterisk manager interface reports events and allows you to command asterisk remotely. Okay. All right. And newest is the asterisk rest interface, which was with 11. That's the one I, I'm going to be occupied during Friday morning, but um, there will be Samuel Gallarneau and Matt Jordan will be doing a terrific presentation on the asterisk rest, rest interface, and why should you care, okay? Because it actually does the same thing. It allows you to script entire bits of logic outside of asterisk. It's newer than the rest, and reconnect using the stasis application. Right. Web programmers, web developers, will be extremely interested in this because it is a rest interface. And I think that we sort of reviewed the config file basics, but we're going to jump in and, and have a look at this, all right, too. Everything that we see here, the configuration files that we started to touch, in, touch on in Etsy asterisk, all named .conf, each application has a configuration file. So if you were going to want to configure voicemail, for instance, what do you predict that that configuration file would be named? Voicemail.com. Cues. How about cues? Cues.com. Works. Terrific. Oh, I can think of another one. Dial plan. Everybody did say extensions.com, right? Okay, good. All right. Very good. And so we're going to look at this. So, how are they constructed? They are constructed with section headers, or in the, they're called contexts if you were in extensions.com. And these section headers denote a little bit of logic. Everything underneath that that is active will be in the form of key value pairs. Here's the key, here's the value. Now tell me about comments. That looks unusual, doesn't it? If you're in an asterisk configuration file, you usually get a semicolon. That is a comment. Nothing on that line is active. It's for you leaving comments. Why do you suppose a semicolon? What's, what's the usual comment character in uh, Linux? Hash, right, pound sign, whatever you want to call it. Why didn't they use that one? Okay, I owe you a patch too. Okay, well, I'm just giving out stickers till I'm silly. Okay, all right. So in any in any case, um, and this is not an asterisk patch. This is an asterisk patch. Okay, all right. It is because, as you said, it's on the keyboard. I mean, key, keyboard. I play piano. Don't listen to me. Okay, and so it is on the keypad. It is a DTMF tone, in fact, isn't it? So you could encounter some craziness if it were used in two places. So looking at extensions.conf in the real world or live. 
going to go in there and I know it in the right place. Then here is my extensions.conf that I've been carrying around with me messing with a little bit. And so it has some interesting things in it. Most of your configuration files an asterisk. And this is just a hint if you're going to take a certain test that requires configuration later. Don't forget the section that's most important called general. Okay? will cause everything not to work. There's a general section. There's also a global section in many of the configuration files. Not always, but most of them. Okay. But these bracketed headings in extensions.conf are called contexts. You'll see them everywhere. Some includes. Right. And here you can see your key value pairs. I've got an example of two, two of a couple of different types. In this one, the extension that I dialed earlier to show you that there's only one channel between a phone and asterisk has several applications. And we're going to touch on these when we get back and start in the dial plan logic in, in a, a little bit later on today. But I can tell you that these are applications. Everything on the right-hand side of the equals arrows is the value. If I were to And yes, I do have sample configurations in here. And asterisk comes loaded with sample configurations for you. They almost always have a general section. This is voicemail.conf. If you ever do not know how to configure something and you just want a quick and dirty example, when you compile asterisk in the samples directory, if you do a make samples, those will all drop into your Etsy asterisk directory. All right. And if you want to wipe them all clean, out of that Etsy asterisk directory, go ahead and do it, and then go back to your original source and look at the samples from there. But they are there unloaded each time you download it. Okay. Once again, key value pairs. And so for a review of asterisk a review of asterisk architecture. As asterisk runs on Linux. Most every version with help you can make it run. Runs best usually on Debian or CentOS, doesn't matter. I think they run fine on either. Right. It has a modular architecture which means that when you change a part of it you do not have to change everything, do you? Part of the argument of why they needed a new SIP driver, other than lots of problems, was that the actual C code for SIP, for Chan SIP, was, real, it was thousands of lines, which is probably not a good idea for a module. All right. And with PJ SIP, the way that it performs and the way that it behaves is much more modular as well. And you can change bits of it without having to wreck somebody else's logic that their business depends upon. You can load and unload whatever you want. I didn't show you the uh, modules.com file. In fact, I better do that before we get away from this. Somebody flag me and remember that we're going to jump over there before we go on break, right? Modular architecture. Remember, you saw me module load and unload from the command line, right? You can actually set things not to load. Does anybody know where you set that? Ooh. Somebody's got it. I heard it. Isn't that amazing? That, that just continues. Modules.conf. You don't want a module to load, just like voicemail.conf, et cetera. Okay. And in fact, has all your modules. Notice this file does not have a general section. Auto load, the behavior of that, in fact. Everything in that directory that we saw that was an SO, asterisk default behavior is to scan that directory and load whatever's in it. Okay. Now you can either not compile that, which means it won't be found in that directory anyway. Or if you've already compiled it and you want to do a quick and dirty thing, then you can use this file to no-load it. In fact, if I were to no-load something called, uh, let's just give it a try, um, no-load. Uh, and you can do this with resources, with apps, with whatever. Let's me res Digium phones. I'm going to kill my phones. Maybe I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to do that this way. Let's no load your voicemail dot com, uh, app voicemail. App voicemail. And how can I find the names of these modules? 
look in user lib asterisk modules, right? Okay, if you don't know them. So in this case, if I wanted to kill off my voicemail, then I could, uh, and remember the modules if you don't want it to load, um, I can either jump into asterisk and do a no load on voicemail right now and not restart it, and the next time asterisk restarts, it won't load that, or I can just do, I can restart asterisk itself. And jumping into there, module show like voicemail, how about that? Oh, nope, how about app? Oh, nothing, how about uh, module? And I don't have to go back to that and change it if I just want it to load that one time. I can do it on the fly. Doop, okay, good. Now people, oh, wait a minute. I had to show like. Hmm. Oh, see, y'all, you know you're not keeping me honest. What's, what's going on out there? You can see this and I can't see it. Look, I can't do modules show like voicemail. God, guys, you want some, a break or something, some coffee. All right, that's much better. Okay. And they're watching me do that. What did I do wrong? I typed the wrong command. If I had been smart and just used tab complete instead, like you should do, then I wouldn't have had that problem, right? Okay, so you can load and unload on the fly, but now unless I load my voicemail again, next time I restart asterisk, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna have the same issue, exactly. Okay, we're gonna do that. Okay, so a little bit about that modular architecture channels. We did talk about channels, certain type of channel drivers. They are indicated in your modules folder, those channel drivers, and you can look at the code for these too. Okay, and we'll show you how to do that a little bit later in the course. Um, they're indicated by a chan, chan underscore something. Applications are app underscore whatever. Resources like music on hold, resource underscore whatever. Okay, pathways in and out of asterisk. Talked about the interfaces, the one you're gonna be using most is most likely the CLI, the command line interface. Right? But you may be using AMI to read events or do command events to asterisk. You may be using AGI to go out and grab something and bring it back. And if I'm not mistaken, Justin may be talking a little bit more about AGI this afternoon, okay? And we introduced you to a little bit of config file syntax, okay? What it looks like? And that's the bare minimum of how to get started with asterisk architecture. Have y'all got any questions before we uh, go to break? The funny thing about that is there's no really hard and fast rule. You can actually use the equal sign in almost any asterisk configuration file and it will still work, okay? However, it's convention to use the equal and that sign, except in the channel driver files. If you look at some of the channel driver files, such as Dottie, the, like a chan .com, for instance, you're gonna notice that it's all equal signs, except for one line that has an equal in a thing. It's sort of like knowing the rules, but it will all still work if you just use the equal sign. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't hear that because of the door. Can you? Okay. All right, help me, help me understand this. Um, show me when I've got this on the screen because I'm not seeing, I sometimes have a trouble hearing from the back of the room. There you go. Okay, that means I haven't used it at all. Okay. I think that this is nobody has ever connected to voicemail on this, on this particular machine because there's actually a setting called call counter that you have to set in, well, in Chan set, for instance, in order for that to count. And that's actually necessary that you set that for both voicemail and for cues. And what this is indicating is that it hasn't been counted. Now, that could mean that my sip.conf file is wrong and I don't have call counter enabled too. So that's kind of a question. I mean, what it indicates is how many times has that application been triggered? 
Okay. Does anybody have any more information on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There certainly is. And in fact, that command is called core restart gracefully. It will wait for all calls to complete. But one other thing that, call, that the restart gracefully does is it actually waits for call recording to get done too. So if you're actually recording something, it's going to wait for that. For instance, somebody's leaving a voicemail, all right, or, or some other recording process is going on and has not finished yet. So sometimes people will see that core restart gracefully, and uh, it won't be restarting for hours, even though you know all the calls are terminated. Check your recording processes. And that's a behavior that can be changed also in a configuration file. OK. Mm -hmm. Gracefully. Mm -hmm. You can do core restart now. Does anybody else know one? Core restart now doesn't wait. It's, it's egregious. It breaks right in there. OK. OK. Got some questions? Mm-hmm. No. They are, they are, core Restart gracefully stops incoming calls. And so, yes, anybody who's trying to get into you will not get anything. They'll get congestion. Your system just won't even bridge to an IVR. I mean, it won't create a channel to do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Hey, y'all want to get, see if there are snacks? I think it's 1030. Is that, yeah? Anybody get some break? <laughs>